Did Israel just admit that it has nuclear weapons? As Israel's war against Hamas entered its fifth week, conflict perception took a sudden and significant turn. In a rare, if not unprecedented outburst, an Israeli minister, Amichai Eliyahu, declared that a nuclear bomb on Gaza was a possibility. Perhaps it was unintentional, but for the first time, an Israeli politician or official has acknowledged the existence of nuclear weapons in their arsenal. And around the same time, the United States announced the deployment of a nuclear submarine to West Asia. America, in fact, has declared that it will intervene if Hezbollah, based in Lebanon, opens a second front against Israel. Let's just break it all down for you. On Sunday, this Israeli minister was suspended, not dropped, just suspended, for suggesting using a nuclear bomb in Gaza. Amichai Eliyahu, an ultra-nationalist politician, is part of Prime Minister Netanyahu's ruling coalition. Eliyahu serves as the heritage minister, and he made this threat during a radio interview. In fact, he expressed dissatisfaction with the scale of Israel's retaliation in Gaza. And when the interviewer asked whether he was advocating the use of some kind of atomic bomb, Eliyahu responded with, quote-unquote, that's an option. And this marks the first time an Israeli minister has implied that the country possesses a nuclear weapon. Israel has never formally acknowledged having nuclear weapons. Prime Minister Netanyahu's office swiftly responded by issuing a statement. It caused Eliyahu's nuclear threat disconnected from reality. The Israeli Prime Minister's office also underlined Israel's efforts to protect quote-unquote non-combatants in Gaza. The statement said, and I'm quoting, Eliyahu's statements are not based in reality. Israel and the IDF are operating in accordance with higher standards of international law to avoid harming innocents, and we will continue to do so until our victory, quote-unquote. But it's important to note here that despite this provocation, Eliyahu was not sacked from his post. He was only suspended from cabinet meetings until further notice. Following the outcry over his remarks, Eliyahu later stated in a social media post on X, formerly Twitter, that his comment regarding the atomic bomb was metaphorical. However, this attempt to rectify his statement did not prove to be successful as it did not escape the notice of the Arab nations. The League of the Arab States issued a statement slamming the Israeli minister's remarks as racist. The statement read, the racist statements of the Israeli minister Eliyahu are revealing. Not only does he admit that they possess a nuclear weapon, but he also confirms the reality of the Israelis' abhorrent racist view towards the Palestinian people. Saudi Arabia also criticized the Netanyahu government for not dismissing him. Meanwhile, Jordan has said that the minister's remarks were a call for genocide and a hate crime, quote unquote, against the Palestinians. And today, in a rare move, the United States military announced the deployment of a nuclear submarine to West Asia, a strategic message aimed primarily at regional adversaries, aimed primarily at Hezbollah and its principal ally and mentor, Iran. The U.S. has dispatched a guided missile submarine, even as the Biden administration says it wants to avoid escalating the ongoing Israel-Hamas war into a broader regional conflict. The U.S. Central Command confirmed via social media that an Ohio-class submarine was entering its area of responsibility. Now, although these social media posts did not specifically identify the submarine, the U.S. Navy operates four Ohio-class guided missile submarines which are former ballistic missile subs converted to fire Tomahawk cruise missiles rather than nuclear-tipped ballistic missiles. And each of these submarines, by the way, is capable of carrying a payload of 154 Tomahawk missiles, significantly outstripping the capacity of the U.S. guided missile destroyers and providing four times the armament of the U.S. Navy's latest attack submarines. Each Tomahawk missile can accommodate a high-explosive warhead weighing up to 1,000 pounds, making the threat impossible for any adversary of the U.S. to disregard. 
The U.S. military rarely discloses the movements or the operations of its fleet of ballistic and guided missile submarines. Instead, these nuclear-powered vessels operate in virtual secrecy. At the very least, this conveys a strong deterrent message directed towards Iran. And America already has two carrier strike groups in the region. The announcement comes as the U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken holds a series of meetings in West Asia. The U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin also recently held discussions with the Israeli Defense Minister. The U.S., you see, has emphasized that civilians must be protected and humanitarian aid for Gaza must continue. But the U.S. has also affirmed its commitment to deter any entity seeking to escalate this conflict, specifically referencing Iran and Hezbollah. The decision comes after frequent low-level attacks on U.S. forces stationed in Iraq and Syria. The U.S. aims to convey that larger attacks will result in a significant response. And let's not forget, all this is happening as the war in Gaza rages on. Israel says its troops have reached Gaza's coastline. They say that they have split the Palestinian enclave in two between North Gaza and South Gaza. An intense weekend of airstrikes saw dozens reported killed at a refugee camp and communications down once again before being restored this morning. Israeli forces, it is a ground, in its ground operation against Hamas, surrounded Gaza City from the air, land and sea. They say that its infantry forces will enter the city in the next 48 hours. But the plight of the residents in Gaza has deepened the humanitarian crisis. And even as the death toll continues to mount, Israel is in no mood for a ceasefire. In fact, it has rebuffed such claims, saying that any deal would require the release of all hostages held by Hamas. This despite the US also now pushing for a humanitarian pause in the fighting. The CIA chief and President Joe Biden's top diplomat, both are in the region amid growing anger at the civilian suffering. Washington is now trying to contain the conflict. The CIA director, William J. Burns, reached Israel on Sunday and held discussions with leaders and intel officials. You see, after at first supporting Israel unequivocally, the U.S. is trying to now prod Israel to pursue a more targeted approach to attacking Hamas. The U.S. is telling Israel to allow pauses in the fighting for aid to enter Gaza and do more to avoid civilian casualties. Clearly, the U.S. is caught in a tough balancing act over Gaza. And in the face of the escalating tensions, a deepening humanitarian crisis and the spectre of a nuclear dimension looming over the conflict. It is becoming increasingly clear all parties must ensure that this war does not become a wider conflict. And we have some breaking news coming in right this minute. South Africa has now decided to recall its diplomats from Israel for further consultations on the situation in Gaza. Now, this decision coming amid a rise in civilian casualties from Israel's war with the Palestinian militant group Hamas. Let's uh, quickly go across to our correspondent, Calden Ongmo, who's getting us more details on this. Calden, what more do we know at this point? Thank you so much. Uh, what I can tell you today, that the minister in the presidency, that's Kumbudu and Shabini, today while giving a briefing on the outcomes of the cabinet, that she announced that South Africa and Shad, uh, actually she said South Africa have announced that they will recall diplomats from Israel for consultation in response to the Israel-Hamas conflict. Now you must remember South Africa is the second country after Shad in Africa that's doing that. And uh, she also said that, uh, you know, they have, South Africa has three diplomats in Israel to be recalled. And she did not move her words while saying that cabinet has also noted that the continuing disparaging remarks of the Israeli ambassador to South Africa about those who are opposing uh, the atrocities and the genocide of the Israel government. So minister said that, and also she said that it is becoming very untenable. And she says this kind of genocide under the watch of international community, especially in South Africa, and it cannot be tolerated at all. Uh, and she also went on to mention, uh, saying that 
South Africa is also considering uh, the current position of the Israeli ambassador to the country uh, while they are recalling its diplomats from Tel Aviv for consultation. But you must remember, South Africa, for time and again, since the start of this war between Israel and Hamas, there has been several protests, several marches that have taken place. Um, uh, AMC, that's the governing party of South Africa, marching uh, to the Israel embassy, calling for uh, calling for President, uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa to say you must shut down at this embassy. The right. opposition party, the economic freedom fighters, also took a very uh, 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 strong stance on saying that they want the ambassador of Israel out of the South Africa. Besides that, there is been actually several protests that are still going on even today. Uh, you know, there are other protests that have been planned for the coming days too. Right. Uh, Calvin, the immediate question that arises is uh, what about the other African countries? Do we see them following suit as well? What more can you tell us on that front uh, given the stance that's now being taken by South Africa? So uh, definitely this war has uh, divided the world. Uh, you know, like I said, South Africa after Shad, that was announced. Shad also, we saw reports coming in today itself saying that they are recalling their, their diplomats uh, from Tel Aviv. So South Africa has become the only second African country to do so. While some of the uh, African countries does support uh, uh, are pro-Palestinians. You've seen other countries supporting Israel saying same thing as what the West has saying, that they have the right to the right to defend themselves. But South Africa has clearly, from the get-go, always um, maintained their stance on where where they stand. They've always said that South Africa is for Palestine. They are not going to change their words. They're not going to miss their words. In fact, the Interna Minister of International Relations, uh, Naledi Pando, also is talking very sternly on this, saying this is not the kind of situation and this is not the way that innocent people in Gaza should die. Uh, you know, uh, South Africa taking a very, uh, very, very strong stance on this. So right. South Africa and uh, Chad, we've seen, are not the only nations to call the diplomats back from Israel since the Gaza conflict began. Right, Carlton, uh, this also coming uh, uh, in the backdrop of the Iranian uh, uh, foreign minister writing to the BRICS countries, in fact, uh, for uh, pressurizing Israel uh, to stop the assault. So uh, a lot has clearly been going on behind the scenes and this latest development only adds a layer of what is expected to uh, come ahead uh, from the region at this point. Sorry, can you repeat the question? I can't. Calvin, I was just talking about how the Iranian uh, uh, foreign minister earlier had written to the BRICS countries as well uh, in order to pressurize Israel to stop this assault. Uh, so there clearly has been a lot that's been going on behind the scenes. Just a quick background for our viewers, uh, just to explain how things reached this point as far as South Africa's stance is concerned. Definitely, uh, you know, most of this country, since the start of this war, you know, people have been uh, engaging a lot. The countries have been engaging a lot. You mentioning this, this that the uh, Iranian foreign minister, you know, has urged member states of BRICS uh, to intervene in this Israel-Hamas conflict and demanded that, uh, you know, this is a dire situation in Gaza and, uh, and it must be put on the bloc's agenda, you know, BRICS countries should definitely uh, make a, this, uh, get together and decide on what's going to happen. You know, as of now, you know, Russia has spoken about it very openly. Um, South Africa has uh, always maintained its stance what's, uh, what's happening. So, so basically, it's uh, China, you know, China, not, uh, China hasn't openly spoken about this as of yet. So, you know, it is something that the BRICS countries, member states, that's why we, uh, that, uh, earlier I said that the Delco minister, Naledi Pando, who is uh, South Africa's interna uh, international relations minister, emphasizing very sternly saying that this is definitely something that the BRICS nations should come together and discuss. Right, we're leaving it there for the moment, Calvin. Thanks very much for joining us with all of those updates. Of course, we will be tracking those developments uh, very closely. But first, let's go straight to news that's breaking this minute. Visuals coming in of an explosion at a residential area in Gaza City. These are the latest visuals that we are getting at this point. Have a look.
Palestinian Health Ministry says three Palestinians have been killed by Israeli forces in the West Bank. Gaza has been cut off from the world again. This is the third time since the war started that communication lines have been cut and we are being told that internet lines are gradually being restored. Hamas spokesperson Osama Hamdan has given a press conference in Beirut. He claimed the Israeli army is suffering military failures on the field. Hamdan also accused Israel of destroying Gaza's medical sector with the aim of displacing Palestinians from the strip of land. In fact, a spokesman for the Gaza Health Ministry has said that Israel is quote-unquote preparing something bad for the Al-Shifa medical complex. One month of the war and the tragedy continues to unfold. Nearly 10,000 people have died so far in Gaza. The Hamas-run health ministry in Gaza saying over 4,100 children have died in the war so far. Over 2,600 women have lost their lives. 152 people have died in the West Bank, 1,400 in Hamas's attacks on Israel. The United Nations has said that 88 UNRWA staff have died in Gaza. The UN saying this is the highest number of UN fatalities recorded in a single conflict. One month on, civilians continue to suffer. Children have been pushed to the front line. Have a look at this. <laughs> Wounded children are being carried to a hospital in Gaza City. In the Gaza Strip, there is shortage of bread, shortage of water. This is Ankara. Hundreds are protesting against the U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken's visit to Turkey. Protesters are accusing the United States, in fact, of complicity in the death of the Palestinian civilians in Gaza. <laughs> Anthony Blinken has wrapped up his West Asia tour and before leaving Turkey, he said the U.S. is working very aggressively on getting more humanitarian assistance into Gaza. We know the, the deep concern here for the terrible toll that Gaza is taking on uh, Palestinians, on men, women and children in Gaza, innocent civilians, a concern that we share and that we're working on every single day. This is Paris. This French Spider-Man is ascending the Paris Tower to call for peace in Gaza. And in Tel Aviv, the families of Israeli hostages are calling on the Netanyahu government to secure the release of their loved ones. Listen in. He's a therapist. He's a very kind person. We hope that he's helping also the other hostages, maybe the children. Romy is one of the best things in the world. She's my little sister. Yeah, we're a total of five siblings. She's the, I'm the first one and she's the third one. She's like the glue that connects us together. We're asking that the first priority of the government would be to bring those people back. Now, immediately. Every day goes by, you know, we're all been some trauma. And I lost my grandfather. My uncle lost his house and their house. Israel has released this footage. It shows civilians walking towards southern Gaza.
An Israeli press release read, and I'm quoting, following the IDF's repeated calls on the residents of Gaza City to evacuate from the area over the last day and in accordance with set hours by the IDF, the IDF has reopened an evacuation corridor to allow civilians in the northern Gaza Strip to move southward for their own safety. Have you ever spotted a snake while you were out walking or maybe at the zoo? How did it make you feel? If you were scared, you are of course not alone. That is how people in general would feel about having snakes around them. However, it seems like that is not the case with party goers in India's national capital region because relocated from their natural habitat, these venomous snakes are now becoming a part of rave parties. You heard that right. Snake venom has been making headlines. Our next report getting you the complete story. Elvish Yadav, a popular Indian YouTuber and reality TV show winner, was recently booked for allegedly supplying snake venom at a rave party. According to the police, they recovered over 20 milliliters of snake venom, five cobras, a python, two two-headed snakes and a rat snake from the accused. While the investigation into the matter continues, this has sparked a broader discussion on the potential misuse of snake venom among youth. The venom is often used as a recreational drug and its smuggling is a multi-million dollar illicit industry. In November 2022, the Border Security Force in India's West Bengal seized a jar containing 2.14 kilograms of snake venom, which was valued at Rs 17 crore, that is roughly about $170 million in the international market. The Narcotics Control Bureau further revealed that most snake venom used in rave parties is obtained from cobras, which are easily accessible through snake charmers and smugglers. The snake venom is transformed into a powder and consumed by mixing it with alcoholic drinks, with prices ranging from $240 to $300. Narcotics officials estimate that half a litre of snake venom can fetch millions of dollars in the international market, with the duration of its effects varying based on strength and quantity consumed. The use of snake venom brings attention to the emerging trend of opioid addiction and its devastating consequences. Opioids are known for their deadly and highly addictive nature, convincing the brain and the body that they are essential for survival. While opioid can be prescribed to alleviate pain or promote well-being when used in moderation, they can also lead to complex issues and even death when abused. In India, the type and pattern of substances being used have changed with time. With around 100 million substance addicts in the country, India has seen a 70% rise in narcotic consumption in the past eight years. In what can be considered a conservative estimate, the United Nations has found that 13% of drug abuse victims in India are below the age of 20. Bureau report, Vion, World is One.